you're back? Yeah. Is it good enough? Yeah. Okay. So it's good, uh, good to, to see you all here. Who was here last week when Pastor Martin shared about the end time prophecies? Okay. So um, are you excited that we're living in the end times? Yes. Or for some of you, you don't want it to end yet. <laughs> well, I hope uh, uh, whenever that happens, what kind of finish do we hope to have? Okay. Based on Pastor Mario, what did he say? We want to have a fantastic, fantastic finish. All right. So let's pray that uh, we all have a fantastic finish, not a mediocre finish, not a disastrous finish. Okay. So I heard some of you went um, jogging today. Is that right? Marathon. Color fun. How, how far? How far was it? Five k. So did you sweat? <laughs> so anyway, oh, that's good, that's good. So uh, yeah, one of my bucket lists in my life is to run a half marathon. Okay, that's uh, 21 kilometers. So uh, I'm almost there. I can run now one kilometer. So 20 more to go. Okay, so yeah. So anyway, again, uh, it's great to be back. Uh, we've been uh, in back-to-back -back conferences in the Philippines. We've met with people over lunch, over dinner, over after dinner. So it was really great. But uh, overall, when it comes to everything that uh, God allowed me and some of the leaders to experience, uh, God really wanted to encourage us. God wanted us to. E God wanted to equip us, and God wanted to empower us. And we're excited because we're part of this uh, worldwide movement to reach out to more people and to, to challenge more people to make a commitment to really put Christ as the center of their lives. So I'm really blessed with uh, so many testimonies of how lives are changed. And really, I've seen it. It's not going to be politics that will change people's lives, not economics, nothing. Nothing like that. Not even entertainers will change their lives. It's really the power of the gospel that will change people's lives. So I'm, I'm really blessed and we'd love to sh uh, share with you more these next few weeks, even today, the things that we learned. Okay? Actually, uh, one of the speakers, his name is Edmund Chan, uh, and he spoke in one of the Sunday services. And the title of his message was, No Half Measures. Okay? So basically, he's, he's thought about that when he says, No Half Measures, never be ha uh, half-hearted. When God gives you a goal, when you have a goal in life, you've got to go for it with all you've got, right? Now, for some of you, one of you here, you're studying. You're studying. Raise your hand, you're studying. Okay? If you are half-hearted, will you get high grades? Will you get distinctions? No. It requires a lot of hard work. you got to go all in if you want to get good grades and uh, do well in your school, right? Now, for those of you who are working, how among you, you're working? Working. Okay. Now, if you want to get promoted, if you want to get distinctions even at your work, you cannot be half-hearted. Okay? The problem with our minds is we want it always the easy way. Okay? I call it the lotto way. You know what's the lotto way? Okay? The way to gain money is to just hopefully make the right kind of uh, numbers, you choose the right kind of numbers, and then boom, you become a millionaire, the easy way, okay? We want the path, the path of least resistance, okay? The path of least resistance is, uh, I want to achieve big goals with the least resistance as possible, but you can't, that can't happen. You cannot achieve things just with half measures or being half-hearted. You gotta go all in, right? Now, for example, do you want, those of you who are studying, do you want teachers who are half-hearted when they teach? Okay. Have you seen teachers who are half-hearted when they teach? Yes! Okay? You've been victims. Right? Now, who among you, you like half-hearted bosses? Oh, have you seen half-hearted bosses? They don't really care, you know, they don't really go all in. So they delegate all the work to you. Okay? And their mindset is, they just want to, their mindset is, I'm giving you all this work, I'm delegating all of it so that you can be trained. Alright? Yeah, right. Okay? So, you don't really want that. Okay? Now, what is one of the most well-known infrastructures here in New Zealand? 
Okay, the Sky Tower, right? So it's one of the tallest, I think, in the southern uh, hemisphere. Would, uh, who, who among you has gone inside the Sky Tower? Raise your hand. You've gone inside, yeah? You've gone up? Nice view. Okay. Now, what if those who constructed the Sky Tower were all half-hearted? Okay. Would, would that be okay? Of course not. All right? So, you know, when there's a big project at hand, when there are big goals to achieve, to be achieved, you need to go all in. You cannot be half-hearted, no half measures, okay? So, for example, when it comes to the Sky Tower, they, it required massive manpower, massive preparation, okay? Massive, massive implementation, massive collaboration, and massive resources to come up with this big project. So in the same way in your lives, if you want to achieve something, it has to, it cannot be half measures. Okay? Now Nehemiah, which is our character for today, is someone that had a big project that needed to be done. He had to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he cannot be half-hearted to do this. So I pray that as we learn about Nehemiah, you will see what it takes for you to achieve the, the goals that God is giving you and also the goals that God is giving to us as a church, you know, as a whole. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, it says, They said to me, okay, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and dis disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. You can see the reaction of Nehemiah here. What was his reaction? He was what? You have to, what do you think? What, did, what is his reaction? What's happening to him? He was what? Crying? Weeping? Mourning? Fasting? Why? Okay? When he saw those walls, maybe we don't understand it. Okay? So I don't know. Uh, if you're living in a house today, and some of the walls fell. Would you cry? Imagine tonight when the walls of your house fall. Would you cry? Okay. Maybe I don't know. Okay. But for Nehemiah, he's the, the they got a report that the walls of Jerusalem were broken, and there were exiles already living inside Jerusalem. Okay. Why was it? Why was it? Uh, why were they in great trouble and disgrace? First, first and foremost. Before, cities had to have walls. If there are no walls, what will happen? What do you think? Okay? If there are no walls in the city, anyone from anywhere, any enemy can enter the city and destroy them. So this is literally life or death situation. Okay? And it's broken down and it's disgraceful. Why? They say during that time, Jerusalem is where God lives. Jerusalem is where God is reigning. And yet, they don't have walls. It's disgraceful. When people look at them, they say, Is that your God? Is that your powerful God that you're bragging about? And you don't even have walls? So it was disgraceful. That's why when Nehemiah saw this, he knew this was life or death. And something's got to change. And that's why he was mourning and he was praying and he knew he needed to rebuild what was broken down. Now, if I ask you, what might be broken down in your life today? Maybe when you look at yourself, you look down at yourself. Okay? Maybe you have a low self-image of yourself because of what people have told you several times over the years. And you're starting to believe them. Okay? Is that what's broken down in your life? How about a relationship? Do you have a relationship in your life that's been broken down? Maybe your relationship with God. How's your relationship with God? Is it broken down? Alright? Or is it, is it doing well? What you have to do is to really think what has been broken down and perhaps some of these things that have been broken down, it was you who caused it and therefore you're experiencing the consequences. But it's possible there are things that are broken down in your life you didn't cause it. Someone else caused it. And yet, it's now broken down in your life because of what they did. Whatever it may be, perhaps God is telling you, it's time to rebuild it. It's time to rebuild your self-image. It's time to rebuild that relationship. It's time to rebuild your relationship with God. 
And perhaps some of the lessons we can learn from Nehemiah is what you can apply in your own lives. Now, Nehemiah is an incredible book. Okay? If you look at all these chapters, it has so many leadership principles. Maybe I can list down at least 30 leadership principles. 30. Okay? And based on the time right now, I'd like to go all these 30 leadership principles. Is that alright? Okay, I'm just joking. Okay? But the idea here is there's so many leadership principles and I cannot share it in just one message. So I will just give you a little glimpse of the leadership skills of Nehemiah and uh, what God has given him. And perhaps you too will learn from it. But the idea here is, if you want massive results to happen, it takes massive action. Okay? Perhaps it starts with a few little steps, but you cannot end with a few little steps. If you want massive results in your personal life, in your spiritual life, things cannot remain the same. You need to start moving. Yes, little steps now, but when you add it all up, it's a massive action. You need to take massive action. Okay? They said insanity. Okay? They said Einstein said this, but when I researched, they're not really sure. Probably not. So anyway, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. Okay? So whatever your habits are today, whatever is your behavior today, if you don't change it, don't expect that by the end of this year, you'll be really so on fire for God. If you're doing just the same thing today, ask yourself, Lord, what should I change today so that I will be a more Christ-like person within the next nine months or ten months? Okay? I'm just concerned that for some of you, you're simply content. Yeah, I go to church. I'm a nice guy. That's fine. Okay? I pray that that is not your mindset. Your mindset is you have a, a holy discontent in your life that you want to grow even more than ever before in your relationship with God. You want to be used by God more than ever before. I pray that there will be no, you know, no kind of complacency in your life, but you would want to go higher in your relationship with God. Okay? For some of you, you would think, yes, I think massive action is what's needed, but it's too difficult. It's too uncomfortable. But I'd like to share with you that God is not concerned about your comfort. He's more concerned about your character. That is why there will be times He will make you uh, uncomfortable just so that your character will grow. Right? So, why don't we pray right now and let's just ask God to guide us in this message and as we learn about Nehemiah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, if you want to take massive action, Lord, we really need your help, oh God. Lord, if we are content right now, change the content the contentedness of our hearts and replace it with a desire to grow even more, to know you even more than ever before, O oh God. So bless our time, Lord. Override all my preparations. Lord, this is your message. Allow me to share it with clarity. Allow me to share it exactly uh, how you want me to say it and what you want me to say. This is all about you, Lord. We dedicate this to you uh, this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's see what does massive action require. Okay. First is a picture. Picture the reality and the possibility. Okay. When you want to have massive action, you first sit down and you picture the current reality and what is the future possibility. Now this is what Nehemiah did when he talked to the king. Nehemiah chapter two verse three to five. Now if you have your Bibles. Open it to Nehemiah. I'd rather that you look in your Bibles than in the PowerPoint. Okay, so Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 3. It says, But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Now the king saw Nehemiah's sad face. Right? Nehemiah, Nehemiah's job was a cup bearer. Do you know what's a cup bearer? Okay. For those of you who don't know this, okay, before the king drinks 
the wine or the juice, he has a cup better. The cup better will first drink the juice or the wine, and if it's good, he gives it to the king. That is the job of a cup better. Why do they do that? Okay. Correct. Because there might be some people, you know, who are, will betray the king and will put poison on the drink so that the king will drink it. So they have a cup bearer who will drink the, the wine and if it's good, he gives it to the king. If there's poison, he dies instead of the king. Nice job, nice job, right? So he's a cup bearer. And yet, finally, this time, he, the king sees Nehemiah with a sad face, right? So the, so the, so the, the king asks, so why are you sad? And that's what he said, okay? May the king live forever, why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So Nehemiah clearly knew what is current reality. Okay? Massive action entails that you know where you're at right now. And you have to be brutally honest with yourself. You've got to be very honest to assess where you are right now. You don't cover it up, you just be honest. And then you ask these tough questions. Right? So example of tough questions, where you're at. These are questions like the faithfulness questions. Have you been faithful to God recently? Are you growing in your relationship with God? Okay. Have you been showing, have, have you seen that your faith in God is growing? Those are faithfulness questions. Is my quiet time solid? Is it passionate? Okay. Am I obeying God rather than man? Those are faithfulness questions. Another is, called the fruitfulness questions. Am I being used by God? Am I volunteering? Am I serving God with all my heart? Am I passionate in serving our Lord? Those are fruitfulness questions. Another is relationship questions. Okay? Am I okay with everyone around me? Am I trying to build relationships? Am I trying to rebuild relationships? Okay? Um, am I in, an encouragement to the people around me? These are relationship questions. Okay? For those of you living, still living with your families, you know, children, how is my relationship with my parents? Am I respectful of them? Or am I just uh, someone who is flatting in the house? Okay? So, do you have a relationship with your parents? Okay? Husbands and wives, how is your relationship with your, with your spouse? Did you get mad when they forgot it was Valentine's yesterday? Or did you go out? You're saving up. Anyway, whatever. Okay, relationship questions. Fourth is the priority questions. Okay, have you been priority? Have you making God your priority? Okay, do you know your priorities? Are you maximizing your time with the people around you? Okay, so priority questions. Basically, ask yourselves, what needs to change in my life? Okay. Is there something with regards to purity? Is there something with regards to anger? How about wasting of time? Is it about my tongue? My tongue is not careful and I just say whatever comes into my mind. What needs to change? Okay. So those are uh, knowing the picture of your reality. Okay. Once you go there, you look at the future possibility. Verse 4, the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. He pictured what can be done through the power of God. He did not know yet what to do exactly, I mean how it's going to be done. But he knew that he had to rebuild the walls. He had the vision to rebuild the walls. Even if he wasn't sure, is anyone going to help me? I cannot do this on my own. And yet, he had that vision of the possibility. If I ask you, what can God do in you and through you if you truly surrender to Him? Okay? I ask you, 
What can God do in you and through you if you truly surrender to Him? In you, you know your character will change if you really let Him. You will become more Christ-like this year than you've ever been before. Okay? That's working in you if you truly surrender your life to Him. Okay? And what can God, through, God work, do through you? If you truly surrender to Him, you say, Okay, Lord, use me. Use me. Whether people will find out about it or not, just use me. And I, I, I guarantee you, if you answer this question well, you will see the possibilities in your life of what can God do in your life and through your life. Okay? You know, as a church, we have our own dreams, right? We have a dream. That's our message last week. Uh, before I left, and I'll, I'll share, I'll remind you of what that dream is um, now. <laughs> Dare to dream. First is, we hope to see discipleship groups being established, are established. We all have a renewed love for God. Evangelism is a lifestyle. There's an able team of volunteers and miracles all around. That's what we hope to happen in our individual lives and as a church. That's the dream. And I believe if you truly surrender your life to God, God is going to use you more than you ever thought possible. For Nehemiah, this was an impossible task. But all he knew was he's going to lift it all up to God and ask God for his help. Picture the reality and the possibility. That's the first step if you want to take massive action in your life. Second, okay, is this. Prayer for favor and fervor. Okay? Prayer for favor and fervor. Well, I'll explain that in a bit. Nehemiah chapter 4, it says, The king said to me, okay, actually we, said, re we read this a while ago, but this is more for emphasis. The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. Nehemiah was so prayerful that firstly, when he found out that the walls were destroyed, he started praying. And now, while in front of the king, okay, while he was about, while he was about to speak to the king, he prayed. Okay, now I don't know if you experienced this, but I've experienced this a lot of times. When I'm going, uh, when I'm going to talk to someone, I'm also praying to God at the same time. Okay? I usually do this when I'm counseling people because when they share to me their deep uh, concerns and issues, okay, sometimes I really don't know what to say. It's like, uh, that's so sad. Okay? I'm not really sure what to say. So I would pray at the same time that I'm listening to someone so that I will gain wisdom from God so that I will know how to counsel that person. So Nehemiah did the same thing. Before, as he was about to speak to the king, he prayed. Okay? He prayed for favor. You know why? First and foremost, if you're the if, during that time, if you're the king and he, he does not like your face because you're sad, he can immediately say, okay, kill him. Okay? So for some of us, okay, if you were living during that time and you were the cup bearer and the king sees you, I don't like your face. Die! Okay? Just because they don't like your face. Okay? Now, do you like the first do you like the face of the person beside you? Okay? If, if, if no, you cannot kill them, okay? You're not the king. Okay? But during that time, if a king does not like your face, goodbye. It's the end of your life. It's not your fault sometimes if that's how you look. But you die. Death because of how you look. Right? But anyway, so he was a cupbearer and he prayed because if he does not find favor from the king, he can be immediately killed. It's easy to replace a cupbearer. So he prayed for favor. Favor that the king will look positively in him. Okay? Uh, so in verse 8, look at this, what happened. Look, look at what happened as he prayed. And because of the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. Okay? If you have favor from 
your boss. Is that a good thing? Okay? For those of you who are working, if you have a boss and you find in your boss find and you find favor in your boss, you know, the boss will let you easy. For example, you ask for a vacation leave and then the boss will easily say, Yeah, yeah, sure. Three days only, we can find. Okay, yeah, all right. Okay? But if you do not have favor with your boss, sometimes the boss is going to give you a harder time, correct? I'm sure you've experienced this. I've experienced this. So you always pray for favor, right? So especially when you get, uh, you know, there's time for one-to-one -to -one, uh, performance evaluation, you pray that your boss will see more of the good things and contributions you had in your job rather than your mistakes, okay? So for Nehemiah, he prayed for favor from the king. Okay? In the same way, we pray for favor, that we gain favor from people, that when you invite them, you know, they, they're lighthearted, they say, yeah, I'll come. When you try to share Bible verses to them, they'll be, they'll be positive. Okay? So you pray for favor. Okay? Now, this Friday, a CCF um, like partnered with with, uh, with with Bayview to come up with some sort of a neighborhood Bayview Bayview neighborhood picnic. All right. So there are gonna be prizes, raffles. There are gonna be games here in Lynn Road. Okay. Now they asked us if we can tie up and we'll provide the sausage sizzle. Okay. So the idea here is it's just a meet the neighbors picnic. And what we want to do is to just build relationships with the people around us and let them see that CCF cares, right? And, P and CCF cares for the neighborhood. We're not there to share the gospel, you know, unless God really opens doors. We're not there to even try to force them and come to CCF like, you know, you want a sausage? You have to go to CCF first. No, 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 no. Okay? Not like that. The idea there is to show that we care and when there is when we build a consistency of sharing if, of being kind to our neighborhood and to the people around you, okay, perhaps one day they will see, oh, I see a consistency of what Christians are and I'm interested to know what they know. Okay? So anyway, when it comes to this, it's this Friday. We have children, you live nearby, you go. Okay? And please also uh, come and volunteer. I don't want to cook the sausages. Believe me, you don't want me to cook. Alright, so I need help uh, when it comes to that. But the idea here is we pray for favor that when they see the, when they see your kindness or when they see the kindness of our church, they will be sort of positive in perhaps one day wanting to come or wanting to uh, to know more about God. That is favor. You pray for favor. Okay? Second is you pray for fervor. Okay, now for some of you it's not really a word that you use regularly, but it's from the Latin word fervor, okay? And the Latin word fervor, it means hot, boiling hot, passionate, enthusiastic, basically. So when you're praying for fervor, you're actually asking God, Lord, give me fervor. Get, let me be white hot for you. You know what? If you want to take massive action you, you know, in your life and you want to achieve massive results, you need fervor. You need really a white hot passion for God to achieve what He wants you to accomplish. Okay? That's fervor. You don't force anything, but you just do your part. Okay? Now, remember last week, Pastor Martin was here. And for the longest time, uh, he was a lay pastor in San Diego. He's working, he's working in, a, in a company, and uh, he's an electrical engineer. And because he knew so much about those technical products, Eventually, he, they moved him to sales, okay? Because uh, when he sells these products to clients, he's able to explain it well because, uh, you know, he's an engineer. So, for the longest time, he was in technical sales and doing his job. But at the same time, he was a pastor of a church, a big church in, um, in San Diego. And he also had three young kids during that time. And they would do, you know, they like, they like doing mission work. So, I, I asked him, how in the world did you balance that? Hey, working, uh, doing ministry, having three children, and you know, doing all these things. And uh, he said, yeah, it was hard. But it was because of passion. 
He was so passionate for God that he will do whatever it takes that, you know, to achieve what God wanted him to achieve. Okay? Now, I've seen it. Everywhere it's busy. Everyone's busy. Okay? Whether you're here in a first world country or where you're in a third world country, it, you know, there's a different kind of busyness. But everyone's busy. But the question is, will you be so passionate that the passion will turn into uh, really a action and it will also turn to you being creative on how to work things out to balance these things because you want to serve God. Lord, you know, you can pray, Lord, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to go about it, but I just want to serve you. Right? And you will, God will give you wisdom how to work things out. Okay? So you pray for favor and fervor. Okay? I'm challenging you. One of the massive things that you can do this year, you pray massively. Okay? Massive prayer. Let this year be the year when you can tell yourself, I prayed this year more than I've ever prayed in my entire life. Write down a prayer list. Come up with a prayer list. Write down, a, write down the names of people that you want to pray for. Okay? Please put me in that list. I need your prayers so that I too will have favor and fervor. Okay? Make a list. And you pray for the dream of our church. To grow more people into Christ likeness, as uh, I characterize the word. So, prayer for favor and fervor. Okay. Are you still with me? Okay. Next, what massive action, massive results? Third is the process. Prepare and proceed. Prepare and proceed. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 13. By night, I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate examining the walls of Jerusalem which has broken down and its gates which had been destroyed by fire. What was Nehemiah doing? He was inspecting. Okay, so this is the problem here, this is the problem here. He was inspecting the, the walls, he was inspecting the gates. So he was preparing uh, so that when the work comes, he's, he's ready. Okay, so that's preparation stage. If I ask you, okay, if I ask you, if God wanted you to disciple someone this year, okay, what do you need to grow in? Do you need to improve your knowledge? Do you need to improve your skills? Do you need to improve your character? Is there a lack of passion? So whatever it is, then work at it. Prepare yourself. If you're saying, oh, I lack knowledge, okay? Uh, I don't even know where the book of Genesis is. And I'll tell you, oh, okay. okay. The idea there is if you have questions, maybe do something massively this year. If you have many questions about God, then let this year be the year that you try to search for the answers to all your questions. Ask the most questions you've ever asked this year. If you're searching and trying to understand who God is, if you're in that state right now, Ask as much questions as you can and research in it. Ask people about it. Okay? There are things that have got to change this year if you want the end result to be different. Okay? If you're saying, I lack skills, I'm an introvert, I don't really know how to speak uh, around people, I don't know how to lead a group, then if that's, if that's what's lacking, then you attend the trainings that we will, that we will have. Okay? So that's the idea. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 70 to 18, it says, Then I said to them, so now he's talking to the people after he's inspected. You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. After all the preparation process, then you start to proceed. Okay? And there is a massive action that needs to take place. There comes to a time that preparation ends and proceeding is the next step. So I'm challenging you, grow more than you've ever grown ever before in your life. If you say you have quiet time, is there... Is there still room for improvement? What do you think? Yes! 
So for me as well, I have my quiet time almost every day, but I have room for improvement. There's still some questions that I want to understand further the answer so that I can explain it more to others. Okay? So let this year be the year where you had the most quiet time you've ever had. Okay? Who knows? Okay? And not only that, maybe this year is the year where you ask all these questions and you try to research and understand what the Bible has to say. Okay? It's called inductive Bible study. You, you really get into God's Word. Okay? Now, to help you guys, what we plan to do is, on March and April, it's possible that practically every week, every Saturday, we're going to have Bible studies and training together. I'm opening it up. Okay? Is it going to kill me every week at the, organizing these Bible studies and organizing Sunday services and preaching? Will it kill me? Yes, but I'll do it. Okay. Okay. But the idea is this, if you're saying you lack knowledge, if you're saying you lack skills, if you're saying you're, lack, you're lacking maybe in character, you still want to grow in your character, then we will provide all the necessary tools that we can give you so that you are without excuse. And God will not, you cannot tell the Lord it's because I lack this, I lack that, I lack resources. What we will do is we will try to provide everything we can so that you can be used by God more than you ever thought possible. Are you with me? Yes. You know, when it comes to our speaker again, Edmund Chan, he said, hey, my goal this year is to read five books. But he realized that's not massive. I really want to learn about leadership. So that year, instead of reading five books, he read 100 books. Okay? All on leadership. Because his mindset is, I want to become a better leader. And I need to take massive action. So he decided, I will read 100 books. Is he still alive? Yes. Okay. So it's possible. For me, I still remember, you know, especially in the first few years when I, was, uh, when I became a Christian, I attended all the Bible studies there were. Okay? I didn't care about the traffic. There were less that time, you know. But, you know, I attend all the Bible studies. And after the Bible study, you know, during the Bible study, I take down notes. Okay? And after the Bible study, during the week, I will review my notes. For some of us, I think we like taking down notes, but you never go back to them. Okay? There's a different way of taking notes, I've noticed. We say you want to see, you want to take down notes, you take a photo. Okay? But, okay, you know, I still remember taking down notes and then reviewing them. And there was a time I would do highlights. Okay? I would highlight with a yellow pencil the key verses that I'd like to memorize. If there's a verse that I don't think I should memorize but I just like, I underline them. Okay? With the ruler. That's what that's how passionate I was of knowing God. Okay? And there are times when I would write down my notes and it was not very clean. Okay? I rewrite my notes. Okay? From this notebook to that notebook just so that I can have a cleaner notebook. But as I write it, I'm learning. And during the time before when computers was not that common for, for Bibles and commentaries, I think you're starting to realize my age. Okay? But I would have a, a parallel Bible, this thing, that when you open, there's the, the four versions of the Bible in front of me. NIV, NLT, NASB, KK. JV, all the Bs. Okay? So I would read the Bible passage four times from four different versions. Then in front of me here is a commentary, another is a commentary here, and I would read them. Because I really wanted to know what God was saying uh, in those Bible verses. So it's not like an overnight that I did all these things. But I invested because I knew that, that uh, knowing God's word will change my life. And it was only by God's grace that not only did it change my life, one day, what I learned, God gave me the opportunity to start imparting onto others, whether on stage or when I talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Okay? So that was massive action. What's your massive action? Okay? Is it coming here every Saturday, maybe three hours, you know, to be trained? Okay? That's nothing. So what's your massive action? Prepare and proceed. I challenge you. 
whether you have a position of, of a D group leader or not, you start discipling this year. You start sharing the gospel this year. You start sharing your quiet time to someone. And you'll be surprised what God can do in you and through you. There's so much that we learned in the conference. And um, we've asked uh, Joel, to Elaine, and Joel and Elaine to share a few more of what they learned. And um, I hope you're encouraged. So let's welcome Joel and Elaine here on stage. Since coming to New Zealand about six years ago, we have never been back to the Philippines. We thought about it, hoped for it, but we were never seriously consider considered it until the opportunity to go back opened up late last year to attend a series of conferences at CCF. Until the very last minute of our flight to the Philippines, we had mixed feelings. We didn't know if we were excited or nervous or probably a little of both. We warned the children of things they should they should and should not do while well in the Philippines, like not drinking from the tap, nor running around in malls, and saying salamat or thank you for every little thing that relatives and friends will give them. We arrived in the Philippines on January 19, and after two days of short catch-up with our relatives, the real purpose of our trip began to unravel. On January 23 and 24, together with Pastor Ryan, Leigh, Paul, and Alice, we attended the Overflow Conference in CCF, Manila. It was our first time to see the CCF main building. Before we left the Philippines, the building was just a prayer item. So upon entering the building, Joel and I were amazed to see in the flesh the fulfillment of those prayers. The Overflow Leadership Conference was heartwarming and inspiring. It was attended by around 8,000 people. It was two days of plenary messages and breakout workshops from CCF pastors and international speakers. For two days, we were blessed to hear about the life that overflows. We were asked to ponder on questions like, do our lives demonstrate that overflowing for God's glory? Will others be attracted to Jesus because of the way we live? Pastor Peter Tanshi opened the conference on how to be inspired to overflow. He said, a Christian life should be overflowing and is characterized by joy and peace through the power of the Holy Spirit. However, you cannot overflow if you are empty. You cannot give away what you don't have. So how can you be filled and have an overflowing life? It is through the heart. By accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, obeying and trusting God, knowing God's word and being faithful and abiding through his constant pruning and molding, Pastor Peter ended with a challenge that every member should be a disciple and every disciple should overflow. Pastor Michael Ramsden, one of the international speakers, is the director of the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. He emphasized that we, Christians, are designed to overflow. He said that as humans are created in God's image, we should embrace the design he has for us. And that includes being filled to overflow. However, knowing that we are designed to overflow is not enough. We need to be equipped. Our hearts should be right with God. We need to make Him the Lord of our life in what we do, say, and think. And we must be prepared through knowing His Word and telling people about our testimonies. Reverend Edmund Chan, uh, which was mentioned by Pastor um, Ryan a while ago, of the Covenant Evangelical Free Church of Singapore, walked us through how to be transformed to overflow through discipleship training. He highlighted that major paradigm shift in discipleship is needed. It should be first and foremost about God and what He has done to you and not, and not what you can do for God. We need to be discipling unto Christ's likeness that leads to transformation. Reverend Chan thought 
taught us how we can be sustained to overflow. He said, Christians have two choices, either to live an overloaded life or an overflowing life. If you have an overflowing life with God, He sustains you day by day, and thus you won't be living an overloaded life. We are sustained by, his, by the promises of God. He will guide us continually, and He will provide sustenance and blessings in exceedingly difficult times. He will satisfy our desires according to His riches. What we need to do is to calibrate our values on what is important to us. We need to remember that we are not here to accumulate material wealth, but we are here to love Him, to praise Him, serve Him, share His love, because He first loved us. And on a more personal note, aside from the happy reunions we have with friends and loved ones, God also surprised us immensely on this trip. We had planned to visit one of my grandmothers, but she had a heart attack and died a day before we were supposed to visit her. I felt very sad, not only because we didn't get a chance to see her, but because I'm unsure of her salvation. On her wake, I found out that my uncle, who now goes to CCF Malolos, and is also involved in planting churches in the entire northern Luzon area. My fears have been quelled, and I know that he has shared the gospel to my grandmother. I also found out that my cousin, who lost his wife to cancer a few years ago, has been attending a CCFD group. And he said that it, and he said that it became his source of strength, of hope, and joy during this time of grief. I also got a chance to be reunited with my old university friends, and I was so surprised and quite amazed to find out that two of them had a complete turnaround in their lives and are now serving the Lord. One of these friends, we jokingly call him the black sheep of the group, had leukemia a few years ago. He now serves in the music ministry of his church and gives testimonies of how God has changed him and cured him of his cancer. <coughs> Another friend who I remembered quite vividly as someone who did not want to talk to me about my faith or about God now goes to CCF re regularly with his family and his son even goes to school at CCF Life Academy. I also got reacquainted with a schoolmate who was the daughter of my father's friend. My father was killed when I was 12. He was jogging with a friend and this friend was kidnapped and my, my father being a witness was killed. Because of these circumstances, this schoolmate of mine never became my friend until a few months before we left for New Zealand. We have remained in touch over the years and made a joyful reunion a few weeks ago. She too has come to know the Lord and is being used to share the gospel to her family. Before we left, she gave me a ring. She told me it was something to remind me of our friendship. I told her it not only reminds me of that, but it also is a reminder of how God can make all things beautiful. Overall, it was a life-changing experience. The Overflow Leadership Conference and the International Satellite Conference and Mission Sunday that followed helped us realize that we, CCF New Zealand, are part of a great movement. The trip was a great blessing to our family. God surprised us on how He provided financially for the whole duration of our trip, and He also surprised us with many amazing stories of lives changed. The world today needs Christ-committed followers who overflow with love, obedience, and service. People will know Jesus by the way we live, how our family members behave, how we love one another in small groups, and how we honor God in the workplace. In Matthew 5.16, it says, that we are beacons that lead others to Christ. In the next couple of weeks, Paul and Alice and Pastor Ryan and Lay uh, will share with you their experience and insights on, on the International Satellite uh, Ministry Workshops and the Mission Sunday. So let's make a massive difference by taking massive action steps for our God. I hope you who are encouraged are inspired and that you will not make any excuse that oh, I don't, I, God did not use me as much as uh, I would want to because of this or that. Okay, I really pray that you will remove all the excuses in your life. Okay, so the process, you prepare and proceed. Okay, my last point. Okay, uh, yeah. okay so, so to review, okay, to review, okay, First is if you want to make take massive action, the first is you picture what? Picture reality and 
possibility. Second, you you pray for favor and fervor. Third, the process you is you prepare and proceed. Okay. And lastly, when it comes to problems are anticipated and addressed. When you are going to take massive action. When you want to really, you know, there's this word, re-engineer. Okay, when you say re-engineer, you're really changing from the inside out everything. You want to re-engineer your life. You want to change your schedule. You want to really change your attitudes. You want to remove the laziness in your life. You, know what? you want to remove your, your angry spirit in your life. There has to be major change. You cannot just be wishful thinking that by the end of this year, I will be more disciplined, you know, my mind is more pure, my life is more God-glorifying. It cannot, you don't just drift to maturity. It has to be intentional. And when you become intentional about it, it is guaranteed that problems will come. Therefore, expect and anticipate that problems will come yet you still address it. So when it comes to Nehemiah, he had so many problems. So one of them, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 8, it says, When Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. Okay. Verse 8, They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Okay? So there's this guy. What's his name? Sambalat. Okay. A little advice on the side. Don't name your children Sambalat. Doesn't sound nice. Maybe in our culture. Might be nice in other cultures. But Sambalat was, you know, has a connotation of really a, a guy who hated the Jews and wanted to stop you know, anything that's good for the Jews. So when Sanballat found out, he was greatly angry. I don't know. When people find out about your faith, that you are a Christian, that you are a Christ follower, uh, do you know people who are really angry with you? Okay. I don't know. Maybe they're not angry. Some are very angry. Or some, they're just quiet, but they know they don't really like your faith. You know what? Anticipate it. Problems will come. Okay. Did Jesus have enemies? Yes. If Jesus had enemies, so will you. Okay. So, turn to your seatmate. You will have enemies. <laughs> but you are not my enemy. Okay. You are not my enemy. Okay. So, there will be problems that will come. Because you want to take massive action, because you want massive results, expect that there will be times you will be persecuted, you will be laughed at, you will be resisted, you will be looked down upon, you will be thought of as weird, you will be thought of as conservative or old-fashioned, you will be discouraged, distracted, and even times you will feel burned out. That's part of ministry. Okay? Ministry is supposed to be hard. Okay? Why? Because you're not only fighting or not, you know, you're not only against people, you're against the spiritual forces that are using people against you. Okay? But you anticipate it and know that when problems come, perhaps Satan is just intimidated with what you are doing. Because he knows, Satan knows, if you really break through and you really live a life that honors God, okay, you will be able to bring so many more people to Christ and Satan does not like that. So when there is, you know, when there is tension, when you sense that Satan is fighting against you, smile at him and say, you are intimidated. Alright? And you pray. Alright? So problems are anticipated and addressed. How did he address it? But... We prayed to our God and posted the guard day and night to meet this threat. So they prayed and Nehemiah was solutions oriented. Okay? And it took hard work as well. Okay? It took hard work. You know what there were times? If you read the passage, 
in order to rebuild the wall and to protect themselves, sometimes they will have a sword on one hand in case there's enemies that will attack. In the other hand, they're rebuilding the wall. Can you believe that? And there are times their shift is 12-hour shifts. And after their shift in rebuilding the wall, their next shift is to guard the wall. But sometimes, they do it at the same time. They have a sword on one hand, and they're rebuilding on the other, other hand. Why? Because they were passionate. They knew this was life or death. They knew this is something worth their effort. Okay? That's why we do this ministry. That's why we have CCF here. That's why I prepare messages. Because I know it's worth it when lives are changed. Okay? Because if, if this is all false, then frankly, I'm wasting your time. Right? If this is all false, I'm wasting your time. And respectfully, I say, you're wasting my time. Okay? I'll just go fishing. Okay? Okay? Frankly, and respectfully, I say, we're just wasting each other's time. But if this is all true, then there's no middle ground. You give it all you've got because lives are at stake. Literally, lives are at stake. Eternal destinies are at stake. That's why we cannot be half-hearted about this. Anticipate the problems and anticipate and address the problems. Look how passionate Nehemiah is. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. Some messengers came to him and said, Come down from building the walls because let's have a meeting and discuss these things. Okay? These were all just distractions. These were from the enemies. And this is what he said. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? And he said this four times because the messenger went to them, went to him four times. He said, I'm up here. I'm doing things for, you know, the, for what God has called me to do. I have no time for these distractions. Okay? Unfortunately for us, we live in a we live in a period where entertainment is idolatry. We love entertainment. Okay? To the point that if it's gonna entertain us, I'd rather do that rather than what God wants me to do. Okay? Entertainment can be computer games. Okay? If that's what's causing you from furthering you down from God, then it's your idol. Okay? If it's going out all the time and you don't have time for more important relationships like your family or for God, then that's your idol. What is your idol? Okay? But when you're so focused and you know this is what God wants me to do, okay, you do it and you're passionate about it. I'm not saying you don't rest anymore. I don't say tonight I won't sleep. You have quiet time 24 hours. That's not it. But the idea is you're so passionate that you really maximize your time. Okay? Nehemiah was so focused okay, that he had no time to lose. Do you know Buzz right here? Okay. Now what's his favorite time? The second most favorite line. Okay? Well, his favorite line is to infinity and beyond. Okay? But what I remember is, he says, no time to lose. No time to lose. Because, you know, he had to save uh, Woody and stuff like that. Okay? Anyway, no time, no time to lose. So I challenge you. You volunteer. You serve. If you see a problem here in church, then be part, be part of the solution. Okay? Are you part of the problem or part of the solution? Okay? So, I, I challenge you. There's so many, you know, there's so many ways you can serve. Okay? Um, Sunday school. Okay? We want more, we want more teachers. Okay? Music ministry. Please, volunteer. You don't want me to volunteer. Come on. I'll be your last priority, but I have no choice. Okay? 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 <laughs> Worship services, communications, you know, there's so many places where you can volunteer, even on a Sunday service. But also when you're in your D groups, there are many ways you can serve there. Okay? So that's the so that's the problems are anticipated and addressed. And look at verse 15. As I close. So the walls for so the 
wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. I'm not sure how large it is. I did some research. Okay, It could be about 3, 4 kilometers, probably 3, 4 meters in height. But still, the point is, it was done in 52 days. Why? Because God gave them the call. A leader stepped up and challenged everyone. And everyone said, we're all in. We're all in. Because of that, miracles happen. I wonder, what can God do in your life? within the next 52 days if you give it all you've got. You know, I was counting it. From now and 52 days after, it will be the week after Easter. Okay, first week of April. What can God do in your life and through your life from now till Easter if you really give it all you've got? You know what? I'm not really sure. But all I can say is, I'll be excited for you. I pray you will ask all the questions you have. You will read as much as you want. You know, you will research. You will have your quiet times. You will, you will pray more than ever before. You will serve more than ever before. And see what God will do in you and through you in these next 52 days. So in summary, okay? So let's read this together. Number one, picture. The reality and the possibility. Second, pray, prayer for favor and fervor. Third, process, prepare and proceed. Fourth, problems are anticipated and addressed. You, these are just what I learned in some of the things in the Himalaya. There's so much more. But if you go through this and take massive action, I guarantee you, by the grace of God, massive results will happen sooner rather than later in your life. And I'm excited for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, right now. We thank you, Lord, for the example of uh, Nehemiah. How you have really used him, Lord, to rebuild something almost impossible to rebuild. And they did it, you did it in 52 days. And we can only imagine right now what's going to happen in our lives, at least in the next 52 days, if we really gave it all we've got and we, if we truly surrendered fully to you. Oh Lord, we know Lord Father God that miracles will abound. Lord, we pray, Lord, right now. We pray, Lord Jesus, that if there are things hindering us from giving all our best to you, can you please reveal it to us, Lord, so that we will know our current reality. And Lord, if we have not really honored you the way we should have, please give us a heart of humility to confess it to you. And be very honest about it. And Lord, if we have a small, only a small and low picture of what can happen, we pray, Lord, that you will change that. And instead, give us a big picture, a massive picture of what can really happen if we truly surrender our lives to you. Oh Lord, use us more than we ever thought possible, oh God. Change us more than we ever thought possible. Use us, Lord, more than we ever thought possible. For some of you, you've probably never surrendered fully your lives to God. And that, if that is your desire today, then I praise God for you. It might, be not, it might not be for everyone, but for some of you, God is telling you, today is the day I fully surrender to God, my life. If that is you, the way you do it is to start with a word of prayer. And you can repeat after me. And the most important thing is your heart, not the words. You can repeat after me if that's your desire. Dear God, I admit that I am a sinner. I admit that I've made mistakes in my life. 
But I thank you that Jesus died on the cross for all my sins. I believe that Jesus shed his blood to remove, to remove all my sins. I now open the door of my heart. I ask Jesus to come into my life and lead my life be my, to be my Savior and to be my Lord. I surrender my life to Jesus today and I commit my life to Him. If you pray that prayer, that's the biggest decision you will ever make in your life. And I'm excited with what God is going to do. Please share it to someone that you've made that decision. Please share it to me so that I can pray for you further later on. Lord, we just come before you, Lord, right now. Thank you, Lord, for the example again of Nehemiah. Thank you, Lord, that we can come before you. You are the God who rebuilds what is broken. You are the only God, Lord, that we want to worship today. Thank you, Lord. We sing this one last song to you with all of our hearts, to the God who rebuilds 